Hey, this is Janine, and I am here with your Wednesday Diamond Mentor Moment, talking about some fun things today, maybe give you a new way to look at things. We are talking about the University of Blues, how avoiding rejection and failure actually hurts your brain. And so let's jump right in. The creative cost of avoiding rejection. I'm labeling it the University Blues. I don't know if you remember, but back in 2019, there was a huge college scandal. And what happened was it was found out, right, the, the government and the Department of Justice and FBI were looking into this for actually a while. And they found out that they were many parents who were paying a particular person to help their child get into some of the top universities in the nation. They even made a documentary about it that's on Netflix, apparently. I have not seen it, but I might go check it out. But what happened was they wrote this person a check and the person had different ways of getting them into school. So they pretended to be on some type of sports teams, like the crew team, you know, teams that weren't headliners like football, baseball or basketball, but the crew and maybe golf. And they also paid for people to sit next to them to take the SATs and the ACTs and other college ad, um, exams to, to get in. And they just really just had strategized just different routes of sneaking their kids into school for the for the for price. When this broke, a lot of people were focusing on the parents, especially because a few of the parents were were famous. I think it was the mom from Full House and some other pretty, pretty famous people, but a lot of the parents, all of the parents were well, um, well off because they were able to pay this person. But I want to focus on the cost of the child the creative cost that the child, the student has to pay. I almost labeled this child abuse. And here's why. You'd be like, Janine, what, what? Their, their parents were just, you know, right, writing them, them checks and they were just basically getting off easy, cutting the line. And we don't think about what is that communicating to the child? First of all, the numbers, 33 parents were involved, $25 million. Um, and like I said, they were going into sports teams and SAT and cheat, cheating. What did that communicate to the child? Here's what I thought about it. From the child's point of view, even the subconscious point of view, that communicates from the parent that I don't believe that you can get admitted to a university on your own merit, or particularly this university on your own merit. To have someone come in and sit next to you while you're taking the SAT. I'm communicating that I don't believe that you have the fortitude and the, the, the will, willpower, the academic strength to do this on your own. And I don't believe in your ability. That's really what they're communicating to the child. With, with by doing all of these things. And then for the child, whoever these children were, I don't even know if they got removed from school or I don't know what happened to the students, but to be there knowing that your parents cut the line, what does that do to their psyche? And so I want you to think about the creative costs of what that does. And here's why this is an important thing. First of all, I'm a parent. We want our kids to succeed. We want our kids to do well. Our students, um, you know, if you're a caretaker or, or you're in, in charge of ch ch children, more than normal, more than often, you want your children to do well. And even if they're playing, you want them to do well with, with making friends, do well on the course, do well on the field. If they're in sports, we want to see our children succeed. It hurts our heart to see our children fail. But guess what? It's a part of the process. And I really want to normalize, I call it attempt making when I talk to my son, hey, I see you made that attempt, different outcome than you expected, but you made an attempt. Because the word mistake and even the word failure has different stigmatations with it or stig stigma with it. And so like, here's a picture that I'm showing about him climbing a high, 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 high slide. Of course you wanna see him succeed, but when they accidentally fall, we wanna save them. But here's what happens when we say them every time. My son was at a playground and he was going on the monkey bars and kind of swinging his body, which is a difficult thing to learn, especially if you're four or five years old, you're still getting that upper body strength. And he was holding on with two hands and one hand slipped and then he was dangling. And of course I'm right there. I might, my, my, my instinct is to go and grab him, right? And, and lower him safely to the ground. But something just told me to stop and just watch him. 
And so he's dangling and, you know, he's feeling on his body and then he just starts swinging and swinging and swinging. And then he throws his arm out and he catches the other bar and he slowly pulls himself up. And I just rejoiced because number one, I didn't save him. And number two, he got to get the feedback on how to get out of that situation without my help how to have autonomy. And so now his brain has the information to do so, to know what to do in that type of situation. We all see, if, if you even have your children by yourself or with, in your own home, or if you've seen other children in other homes, a lot of us have seen video of children learning to walk and you see them fail over and over and over again. No one trips out if they fall and they get back up and they fall and they get back up because you know it's a part of the process. But we don't see what's going on in the brain. The brain is steadily getting feedback information upon each attempt, upon each fall. How is gravity working with their body? How is their, their um, cerebellum going? The, the cerebellum is the back part of the brain that is really in, um, a big part of your motor mo movement and your balance. This area back here, movement, I'll be talking a lot more about this in the future, has about 80% of the brain's neurons is packed in this back area, and it's largely used for motor movement and balance. So that's what they're, they're strengthening every time they fall. But we see falling in the general sense as failure, as mistakes, and not falling as feedback and those learning steps that the brain sees it in. And so, you know me, I'm coming at you with the neuroscience behind intercultural creativity and building a creative identity within ourselves, our team members, and our youth. Dr. Kelly Lambert has a wonderful TEDx out there, and that's why I left the title on this screen, for those of you who can see the screen, called Improving Our Neuroplasticity. Once again, we think that the brain is just growing at crazy rates during childhood, which is true, zero through four. Zero through five is the most critical years, zero through three, actually, um, and up to 12, right? And the prefrontal cortex isn't done growing till about 25 years old. Keep that in mind. But even to the last day of your life, your brain is still structuring and restructuring itself. How? A lot of times based on experiences, experiences, failures, mistakes, success, right? The journey of life, your brain is structuring and restructuring based on experiences. So Dr. Kelly Lambert um, really is, she's a neuroscientist and I have to bring more, more women neuroscientists to the, the board here. So I'm so glad I discovered her, her work. She looked at effect effort-based reward tra training. And what does that mean? So they had rats in, in this lab and the rats loved Fruit Loops. And so they gave them some training periods of them going to find the Fruit Loops. They had one group of rats that they actually had to work hard to find the Fruit Loops. And they worked and they failed and they learned from their failures and they went and they had to basically harvest these Fruit Loops and get the reward through a significant amount of effort. And then, of course, if any of you do studies, you know you have a control group. And the control group, they just got Fruit Loops just for laying there. They even gave them little titles, the worker rats and the trust fund rats. Now, that's their title. That's not my, my title, but that did make me, me laugh. So the trust fund rats just got Fruit Loops just for laying there, didn't really have to do anything. And the worker rats had to work hard to, to get them and to har harvest them. And I'm going to read the findings of what they discovered with these rats. First of all, the worker rats, when they, after they went through this training period of the Fruit Loop training period, they put them in new situations, right? Like uh, swimming, which the rats never swam before, but the worker rats were able to grab hold of the process a lot faster than the trust fund rats. And she discovered that, um, that we are engaged in behaviors that allow us to pull the experience from our past experience, pull the information from our past experience and apply it to our new experiences. And so um, when we engage in behaviors of this effort that we can see the results of our work, that it really helps consolidate the circuits in our, our brain. And that now we have this experiential capital to bring with us to these new journeys that, that life has us on.
right? And it reminds us that we can do, um, the things that we can do can make a difference. Don't forget, we are in a VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And so the fact that new experiences are coming up a lot more rapidly than before, people who have gone through failures, people who have gone through rejection have that experiential capital to bring into new situations. She also discovered with the worker rats versus the trust fund rats that worker rats had more evidence of neuroplasticity and this brain fertilizer, it's a long name, like uh, it's a four letter um, acronym name, but we just call it the brain fertilizer. Um, there was more of the brain fertilizer around the brain. This is called brain derived neurotrophic factor, right? Um, and there was more complex connections of neurons within the brain. They also found out within the worker rats, there was lower stress hormones and higher hormones of resilience, right? Everyone's talking about resilience, but no one really, really talks about how do you train for resilience? Let people experience failure, mistakes, getting falling down and getting back up again, metaphorically speaking and physically speaking, you know, for children who are learning to walk. And this is important for mental health. But the main point that I want to bring up is we think we're helping our kids and our team members by saving them from every possible rejection, but we're not. They need to know how to fall and get back up again. I, in my work, I really push for the cause of arts education and arts training and dancers, musicians, people who go out for gigs and go out for auditions, they know this firsthand. If you're a professional dancer, you have built up the muscle to deal with rejection, right? There's one spot and there's 500 people going for one spot. You've built up that muscle. And so that muscle helps you in future situations. So let them fall. Let them fail, let them get rejected from time to time. You're there, you're still their foundation. You're not letting them get like hurt, hurt, but you're letting them um, just go through the mo to go through the moves of building that muscle of getting back up again. That's what we want. And they know that we're here. My son knows that I, I'm here to, to console him, to encourage him, but also to say, you can do this. Let's try it a different way the next time. Let's see how you can learn from that experience and apply this information when it comes up again. And so once again, my name is Janine. I am the founder and creator of the term intercultural creativity, which is the intersection of cultural competence, right? And you can build a culture of resilience and creative thinking. They actually sit on the same set of cognitive skills, which is the seven gems of intercultural creativity that I lay out in my book, the seven gems of intercultural creativity here. And you can get this on cafestrategies.com or janineletford.com. And we also have a children's book. We're writing our second one right now, but the first one is I Am Creative, where Sean actually goes through life and goes through the creative acts that he employees and he learns from and he experiences, right? Everything in this book he experienced firsthand besides him being in a hot air balloon without adult supervision. And he talks about what it means to be creative. And so keep that in mind. This is your diamond mentor moment. Our logo is a diamond and it's here to remind you that you can shine bright, you're multifaceted. And some of those facets come into being through rejection, failure, resilience and getting back up again. I will see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye.